Thank you. Thank you. It's a real pleasure and honor for me to be here today with you, distinguished guests, excellent speakers, and one of the most experienced diplomats worldwide, Nick Burns. I was checking uh, the latest news on Iran, uh, US, Iran, Israel, following uh, uh, shy discussion. Uh, there is a report, shy today, I think is not in, in national interest, uh, saying Israelis, they like Iranian pistachio more than American pistachio. <laughs> uh, I, I believe I believe it's good to advise Netanyahu to import a little bit Iranian pistachio <laughs> rather than advocating war with Iran. Uh, I have been asked to talk about uh, two issues, Iranian nuclear crisis and Iran-US relations. I believe the first one is a billion dollar question. The second one is a trillion dollar question. We are lucky nobody claims Iran has nuclear bomb. The International Atomic Energy Organization for a decade has launched over 4,000 man, day, man days inspection and confirms there is no nuclear bomb. Again, we are lucky even a national intelligence estimate of the US in 2007, in 2011, confirms not only Iran doesn't have nuclear bomb, but there is no evidence of diversion toward nuclear bombs. And Iranian decision makers has not made any decision to make nuclear bomb. This is good news. Uh, Iranians really do not understand why Iran's nuclear issue is maybe number one issue for the United States. They, they, they simply don't understand because the five powers they are talking with Iran on nuclear today, they have referred Iranian file to uh, United Nations Security Council within chapter seven, which means Iran nuclear program is threat to international peace and security. The reason Iranians do not understand is because they see the five powers they are negotiating with Iran. They have over 20,000 nuclear bombs and these 20,000 nuclear bombs are not threat to international peace and security. And Iran, which doesn't have even one single bomb, is threat to international peace and security. They, they really don't understand this logic. And furthermore, they see the United States has strategic relation with countries like Israel, like India, like Pakistan, which they are not member of non-proliferation treaty. They possess hundreds of nuclear bombs. And the US has a strategic relation with them and putting all pressures, sanctions, hostilities toward Iran, which is member of NPT and does not have nuclear bomb. Nevertheless, this is the fact. For the US, foreign policy, Number one issue is Iranian nuclear crisis. Where is the problem? The problem is about Iranian intentions. Whether Iran is intending for a peaceful nuclear program or a weapon. Although we as Muslims, we, we believe only God can read the intentions of human. And it's, it's not possible to gauge the intentions. But I have no other way today to talk with you about the intention. Because this is the, the, the main issue. 
although they believe there is no nuclear bomb, but because of huge mistrust between Iran and the West, Iran, Israel, and Iran, and its neighbors. Therefore, they, they, they are worried about Iranian intention. I think any peaceful solution in the future for Iranian nuclear program, we need to understand uh, whether the current status quo of Iranian nuclear program is because of Iranian intention or the mistakes of the West. The history of Iranian nuclear program goes back to 1957. I mean, Iranian nuclear program born in 1957. I also born in 1957. <laughs> but I'm not nuclear bomb. One period is 1957 to 1979, during Shah time. In this period, the US decided to lay the foundation of a nuclear Iran. It was the United States who laid the foundation of a nuclear Iran. The first Iranian nuclear facility was built by United States of America in 1967, Tehran Research Reactor. The US proposed Iran to have 23 nuclear power plants by 1994. From 1975 to 1994, about 20 years, 23 power plants. Europeans, they were competing with Americans to win lucrative nuclear projects in Iran. Germany signed a, a contract for $8 billion to, to build the first Iranian nuclear uh, power plant. <clears throat> France signed a, a contract for $1.2 billion for a consortium on enrichment with Iran in, in, in France, not in Iran. Nevertheless, it was clear for the US, for the West, for Israel, that the Shah is definitely after nuclear bomb. Shah was decided to, to have uh, reprocessing, enrichment, 23 power plants, everything. Therefore, if we are talking about Islamic Republic of Iran intention, from 1957 to 1979, we should not blame Iran after 1979. I do not blame the US. I really appreciate the US helped Iran for such a technology. But anyone who is going to blame, I believe, <coughs> Islamic Republic should not be blamed for the foundation and such a, such a history and background. And another dilemma for Iranians, <clears throat> even Iranian officials, is the fact that if Shah were alive, uh, alive today, Iran would have multiple enrichment sites with hundreds of nuclear weapons and with at least 23 nuclear power plants. 34 years after revolution, clerics powering in power in Iran, Iran does not have even one enrichment site, I mean, at the level of industrial scale, which it needs about 50, 60,000 centrifuges. Iran has only one power plant and doesn't have nuclear bomb. Whether we should appreciate Islamic Republic of Iran not having bomb 23 power plants, enrichment sites, which the US and the West planned for Iran to have, or we should pressure Iran. This is another question really Iranians do not understand. Right after the revolution, the revolutionaries decided not to have nuclear bomb, not to have 23 nuclear power plants, not to have enrichment in Iran, not to have reprocessing. This was a big shift. Exactly, they had only one plan, 90% was finished, one plant, 
It was Boucher power plant, paid 8 billion Deutsche Mark to Germans. 90% was finished. They had to finish it. There was no other way. But they canceled everything else. And they had to keep Tehran Research Reactor because it was built in 1967. And they need it because it is for isot producing isotopes for uh, patients dealing with cancer. Exactly in this period, right after the revolution, when Iran decided not to have all Shah's plan, ambitious nuclear plans, the US and the West decided to uh, withdraw from all contractual commitments with Iran. The Germans, they decided to cancel, to stop, not to complete the only power plant in Iran. Because the US position was Iran cannot have nuclear power plant. This is a red line. As a member of NPT, many countries, we have over 600 uh, nuclear power plants worldwide. Every, many countries they have. Therefore, the first decision the US made, no nuclear power plant in Iran, while Iran had won and decided to cancel the other 23. Immediately, France followed the US and canceled enrichment program because it was supposed the fuel to be produced in France, not in Iran, to be sent for Boucher power plant. They got $1.2 billion from Iran, but they canceled the contract. They left Iran with a situation. We are not letting you to have nuclear power plant, which is your legitimate rights under NPT. We do not appreciate you canceling 22 other power plants. We do not appreciate you for canceling enrichment uh, plants. We do not appreciate you for not having nuclear bomb, but even we would not give you fuel from international market. This was the message right after revolution 1980s to Iran. This episode left Iran with no other option to go to produce fuel inside Iran, to go for self-sufficiency, because nobody was uh, ready to give fuel to Iran. The third event, very unfortunate event, was invasion of Iraq. Iraq uh, invaded Iran in 1980s. And unfortunately, West, East, US, Europe, Soviet Union, all Arab neighbors, they supported the aggressor for eight years. One million Iranians, they were killed and injured. And they supported aggressor with all weapons, money, propaganda, intelligence, everything. And they sanctioned the victim of aggression, Iran. Just right after the revolution, the first year after the revolution, Iran was attacked by Arab country. A million people, they were either killed or injured. I'm from a very rich family. Before revolution, a big carpet maker, my father, over 2,000 employees before revolution. Even from a rich family like me, my brother was killed in war. Three cousins, they were killed in war. My wife's cousin was killed in war. Because there is assumption that, that the people they went to war, they were from low class family. No. Even billionaires, they, they gave huge cost. The next was, this, this message was clear to Iran. This was a clear attempt to bring regime change to disintegrate Iran. Saddam Hussein officially announced Khuzestan, the south, southern province of Iran, is a part of Iraq. And all Arab countries, they supported. It was a clear message to Iran 
that we would support invasion and we would support regime change and we would do everything to disintegrate Iran. Very clear message. The next event was the use of weapons of mass destruction against Iranian. When we are talking about nuclear bomb, weapons of mass destruction, we need to know the realities. Saddam Hussein used chemical weapon against Iran. 100,000 Iranians, they were killed or injured. And the US and the Euro provided material and technology for Saddam Hussein to attack Iran by chemical weapons. And now the US is blaming Iran for weapons of mass destruction. Iranians, they are victim of weapons of mass destruction. Iranians are victim uh, of aggression of an Arab neighbor. And everybody is blaming Iran, threatening Arabs, or weapons of mass destruction, or nuclear weapon, or so. But they forget the realities. Here it was again another message to Iran that we would use weapons of mass destruction to annihilate you. We have no problem to use mass weapons of mass destruction. But can you imagine when Iranian army went to late uh, supreme leader of Iran to get permission to reciprocate with weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapon, and he did not permit it. He said, Weapons of mass destruction are haram, forbidden, religiously. Can we imagine any other country during a war when the enemy is using weapons of mass destruction, killing one or injuring 100,000 people, but the, the, the religious leader says, no, you cannot reciprocate. Uh, when, when during a war, Iran even did not use weapons of mass destruction to reciprocate aggressors like Saddam. I really don't understand why everybody is talking today about nuclear bomb attacking Israel. Therefore, it's clear that right after revolution, Iranians, they had no intention neither for reprocessing, no enrichment, no power plant, nothing. They just wanted to finish one paid, already paid power plan and to get fuel from France. That's it. I was involved uh, uh, with, with Europeans uh, from uh, mid 80s to uh, mid 90s. Believe me, in one, over 100 meetings I told Germans that if you complete Boucher, Iran would not have to go for self-sufficiency to build fuel inside the country, enrichment. And we would be ready to accept any kind of supervision by international community and even by Germany. And even we would be ready to pay to German supervisors for 24 hours just in, in one power, nuclear power plant. They said we cannot because the US object. This is not our decision. OK, ultimately they pushed Iran to go to build fuel cycle. They say why Iran hide it, concealment. Could you, can you tell me any other way for Iranians when you are sanctioned? No nuclear power plant, no enrichment, no fuel, nothing. And you are, you are putting all pressures, limitations. Article 4 of NPT is an obligation for every member of non-proliferation treaty, NPT, to cooperate on peaceful technology with other members. They closed Article 4 for Iran. Therefore, Iranians, they had to go to, to uh, black market. There was no other way. They had to go to black market behind the scene to, to, to make their own uh, fuel cycle for fuel, providing fuel for Boucher. There should be no complaint why, why Iran did it in secret. Could you imagine Iran would have come to United States that we are going to build enrichment plan? I mean, this is really a joke. 
But in 2003, when I was member of nuclear negotiation team and spokesperson of nuclear file of Iran, working with President Khatami, we had two years of negotiations and we told very clearly to Europeans, every objective guarantees, every objective guarantees on non-diversion of Iranian nuclear program, every transparency measures, we are 100% open. We started to implement additional protocol, which is uh, a protocol gives the IAEA the most in intrusive inspections. We opened military sites to IAEA. Even for a period, we, we uh, suspended the enrichment plan as a goodwill, confidence building measures. But we told Europeans only respect the legitimate rights of Iran under NPT. Then we would accept every transparency measure, every objective guarantees that Iranian nuclear program in the future would not divert to nuclear to weapon. Even we told them we are ready to commit to enrich below 5%. They said, sorry, the US says zero enrichment. That's why the negotiation failed. If that time, the US have been realistic to respect the rights of a member on their non-proliferation treaty. Iran would have accepted to, to go below 5%. We proposed them to, to limit the capacity of enrichment. We proposed. Iran would have continued to, to be 100% open, even the military sites. Today, today, the, the, the West has five demands from Iran. The first one is to implement additional protocol, which I said gives possibility of intrusive inspections. To implement subsidiary arrangement code 3.1, just to know this is another arrangement which would give more transparency. To stop enrichment at 20%, to go below 5%, to uh, cooperate with the IAEA on the possible military dimension issues, which practically requires Iran to give access beyond additional protocol, which there is no international treaty beyond additional protocol, and to limit the stockpile. In return, Iranians, they have two demands to respect the rights of Iran, like any other of, uh, member of NPT, and to lift the sanctions, ultimately. All nuclear-related sanctions, if Iran accepts these five major demands, then you lift the sanctions. Iran is ready to accept the five demands of big powers, but within a package, because Iranians, they want to see the end state. To include five major demands of the West and the two major demands of Iran. To be implemented step by step with proportionate reciprocation. Here is the big deal. And I'm afraid if, if the West, the US, especially the US, makes another mistake to dismiss this opportunity, then it, that, that they would push Iran, or, or if they accept the invitation of Israel to attack Iran, then the last step would be taken, Iranian nuclear bomb would be realized. A country which from the beginning didn't want anything, even on the 20%. For the first time, the Iranian uh, foreign minister in 2010 proposed, you give us 20%, we don't want to have 20%. We don't want to exceed 5% enrichment. Just give us fuel rod for Tehran research reactor. We have 800,000 patients for, for cancer, struggling with cancer. They said no. When Iran enriched 20%, in September 2011, Iran proposed the US and the West to stop 20%. 
Everybody today is, cry is crying for 20%, 20% is threat, nuclear bomb. Iran didn't want to have 20%. It was Iranian offer in 2010, 2011, we do not want to exceed 5%. We want to st stay below 5%. Just give us the few rods. I, I hope the US and the West would be realistic to, uh, to, to put all five major demands they have. Although some of them, they are beyond NPT. Because NPT permits every member to enrich to 100%. When Iran today is ready to enrich below 5%, there is no other uh, protocol beyond additional protocol. But today, Iran is ready, as the foreign minister of Iran publicly stated, to go to give access beyond additional protocol. If they accept today, I believe the threat of capability, everything would be resolved within two, three years. On Iran-US relations, all administrations during the last 30 years, 34 years, have followed the policy of dual track, with no exception. All of them. Pressure, diplomacy. But in practice, they have implemented, they have put their capacity 95%, at least 95% for pressure sanctions, and perhaps 5% for diplomacy, if not 1%. And Obama is not different. Although he came with engagement policy, from the first months in his office, he signed a directive to expand, increase, covert war against Iran. Although he introduced engagement policy, today the most crippling sanctions, unilaterally, the US has ratified, decided during President Obama, the most crippling international sanctions, as President Obama himself said, that we organized international sanctions against Iran, and intelligence war, covert war, economic war, everything already is underway between Iran and the US, and this is extremely dangerous. How we can get rid of this situation? Negotiation with the US is red line, no. The Iranian supreme leader permitted during Rafsanjani, during Khatami, during uh, Ahmadinejad to have direct negotiations with the US on different subjects. Relation with the US is red line? No. Iran only has one demand or one expectation. A normal relation based on mutual respect and non-interference. How to start the talks? Americans, they, they, they use always the language of threats. They put the gun, as just some days ago, Iranian leader publicly said, you put the gun on our head, and you are telling us either negotiate or we would kill you. What kind of negotiation is this? Iranians are inviting the US to have a negotiation without threats, without hostility, without coercion. I hope, I'm saying all this, it doesn't mean Iranians, they have not had hostile actions against US in the last 34 years. Bunch of hostile actions. But I'm not here to present, I mean, uh, the, the, the American or Western views. I hope the two leaders, they would be brave enough, having John Kerry, Chuck Hagel, hopefully on board, to, for, for the period of negotiation, I'm not talking forever, just for a period of negotiation, to stop hostilities and threats, to use the language of respect, and do not humiliate such a great nation with 7,000 years of history with threats and humiliation. To have a broad package, because Iran-US problems are not limited to nuclear. 
Afghanistan, Iraq, terrorism, Israel, peace process, we have a lot to say, to talk. A, a, a comprehensive package on the table, and to start with common interest issues. Unfortunately, the US policy has been to concentrate on disputed issues for 30 years, and even today, they are concentrate, concentrated only on nuclear, while Iran and the US, they have more even if not equal, I believe they have more com interest of, uh, uh, issues of common interest, like Afghanistan. The US is going to withdraw from Afghanistan. Like struggling together combating uh, uh, Al-Qaeda terrorism, drug trafficking, stability in Iraq, cooperating on Issues of common interest is the best way to remove the mistrust, not to fight for 30 years on the disputed issues. This is my three principles. How to talk with Iran, how to revive the Iranian-American relation. Exactly, Nick, 30 minutes, not to blame Iranian as unpredicted people, and predicted <laughs> 30 minutes finish. Hussein, thank you very much for your remarks. Thank you know, you. when you were speaking, I was thinking that we had never worked together because we never met while we worked for our respective governments because our governments yes. have been estranged from each yes. other. Yes, unfortunately. For, 30, for three decades. Although we worked on the same issue. I worked on the Iran nuclear issue for, for my government, you yep. for your government. Just, just two, three months ago, uh, Nick, when I read your article uh, at Boston Globe, how to resolve Iran nuclear issue. I mean, I, I felt we are 95%. We have the same uh, understanding how to resolve the nuclear crisis. Well, let me, let me ask, now that you've said that, let me disabuse you probably of that Please. notion. You, um, <laughs> you asked at the beginning a logical question. Why is it that um, Iran is considered a threat by the United States? You said Iranians don't understand that. I would submit it's because there is just no trust whatsoever yes. between our two governments. But beyond that, there have been four UN Security Council Chapter 7 resolutions passed by the UN since December 2006, all of them supported by Russia, by China, by the United Kingdom, by France, by the United States, and variously by other countries, Brazil, India. There's hardly a country in the world that supports the position of your government. 95% of the world supports these sanctions resolutions because Iran has been refusing to negotiate with the Perm 5 countries since June 2006. You continue, your government continues to enrich uranium against the express wishes of the United Nations. The International Atomic Energy Agency reports, which are public, people can read them on the website, consistently say Iran is withholding information from us, and we're the UN agency, and Iran has lied to the United Nations consistently about its nuclear program. So I would say that the no trust barrier is really a universal global no trust in this revolutionary government in Tehran. First of all, Nick, I said if Iran had to go for self-sufficiency uh, uh, to black market, Iran had no other way. I mean, if the US has not stopped Germany for just one single nuclear power plant, and if France has not stopped its enrichment agreement Fuel was supposed to be produced in France. When they closed every door toward Iran to defend its legitimate rights, they left only one door to go for self-sufficiency and black market. Here, the world powers, including the US, they were shocked. But there was no other way for Iranians. They have one logic, Nick, Iranian. They say we are a member of NPT. 
we are ready for every transparency measures. Our problem is not with transparency measures. We are ready for every confidence building measures assuring international community that Iran would not go after nuclear bomb. If you do not target our legitimate rights on their NPT. The UN sanctions, even if they all, all powers they have supported, they are asking Iran for indefinite suspension of its legitimate rights. Nobody knows they, are, they mean one year, 10 years, 100 years, nobody knows. This is a clear discrimination. And believe me, uh, when I'm talking with my previous interlocutors on nuclear negotiations, in private they tell me to say definitely these resolutions are illegitimate, but we cannot say. I invited them, one of them, to my class at Princeton. Thanks God, he told all my students that even if we consider this is legal, because when the five world powers, they decide uh, to, to pass a resolution, we, we can consider legal, but it is 100% illeg illegitimate, because Iran doesn't have nuclear bomb, because Iran is a member of NPT, because Iran has no evidence, uh, uh, there is no evidence of diversion. The mistrust, Nick, I agree 100% with you. But we should recognize the mistrust is mutual. Iranians also, they have their own reasons not to trust. To overcome, I mean, m m my point is this. Do we have any other option, Nick? We have within three days the next talks. And I tell you this would fail. From now I tell you this would fail. The reason is clear. American delegation, is going to Kazakhstan Almaty with no authority and power to recognize the rights of Iran under NPT and to lift the sanctions if Iran accepts everything. That's why the negotiation would fail, and for another 10 years, this would fail. My, my proposal, Nick, correct me if I'm wrong, is to go to negotiation table to put a set of measures on transparency, whatever you have, at the maximum level of transparency, internationally exists. To put a set of measures on no breakout capability that Iran would never go to nuclear bomb, like capping at 5%, and your expertise, they know much more better than me, how to put a set of measures on breakout capability. Present you your two sets on transparency and no nuclear bomb, but respect the, the Iranians' demand, the rights under NPT, all together. If you know any other way to resolve this crisis, I would really appreciate to hear. The, um, where I disagree with you, respectfully, is that you seem to put all the onus on the United States, which is convenient for you, to say the United States is responsible for our isolation. No. Just let me finish. No, no, Nick. The US is, if the US does not agree, they cannot move forward. This is the potential and power of the US. So what I was about to say is that you asked that your rights under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty be respected. Uh, you put the onus on the United States for not respecting those rights. But the Russian government doesn't want you to have the right to exercise those powers. And the Chinese government doesn't. And it's because you have withheld information from all the United Nations. And the Security Council does have the authority to suspend your rights especially when your government's lying to a UN agency. And those are the may facts. I, may I correct you, Nick? You can, you can try, okay. sure. <laughs> I'm not sure you'll convince me. In 2011, Russians, they presented publicly, officially, step-by-step -step proposal. Summer 2011. 
In this purpose, this is Russia, which you, you focus on Russia and China. China immediately supported Nick. The US and the Europe, they rejected. If you believe Iranians, they are naive. You, 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 you would respect the Russians, they are not naive to understand what is the UN Security Council resolutions. They put all major demands of United Nations Security Resolutions and IAEA resolutions in the package. The package was this, Nick. For Iran to implement additional protocol, which is one of the major demands of United Nations, right? To implement subsidiary arrangement code 3.1, to limit enrich enrichment sites to one site, to stop new generation of centrifuges, to cooperate with the IAEA to remove all technical ambiguities, including possible multi-dimension issues, and in order to address the, the, the UN resolutions to suspend for three months enrichment. This was Russian proposal. Lavrov came to Washington. Hillary rejected publicly. Russia supported. This was Russian proposal. China supported. Iran went to public and officially welcomed the, the, the proposal as the base for negotiation. When two superpowers, Russia and China, and one European, which I don't want to name, you would understand, also he was, uh, had, had sympathy, three members. The US declined. Why? You haven't convinced me. It was, and, and the uh, reason, you, are, you are not informed about Russian proposal, and the reason, or you know. And the reason you haven't convinced me is because Russia and China still have sanctions on your government because there's no trust between them and your government. No, the so sanctions, I, think, I agree with you, they supported the UN resolutions until 2011, Nick. 2011, Russia came with the proposal to US, to Iran, to Europe. China supported, Iran supported, Europe rejected, US rejected. Then Vladimir Putin said, now we understand. This is public statement, Nick. The US under the umbrella of non-proliferation, the US is after regime change in Iran, not resolving the nuclear uh, 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 file. This was public statement of Prime Minister of Russia. Are you convinced, Nick? No. Thank you. <laughs> but I don't want to, I don't want to monopolize. See, this is a part of complexity between Iran and the US, you know. <laughs> I don't want to monopolize this beautiful conversation we're having because we have people want to ask questions, but Russia and China will be sitting on our side of the table, not yours, because your government's isolated and you've miscalculated. Question in the balcony. Thank you very much. I'm Alan Hyman, and I'm a professor emeritus at Columbia University. Over the years, I have heard many officials from Iran at Columbia, President Ahmadinejad addressed our students, and at the Council on Foreign Relations, and at the United Nations. And I've always listened very closely as to how they refer to the Jewish state. They either call it the little Satan, or they call it the Zionist entity. I listened very closely to you today, and I heard you, for the first time I ever heard an official, refer to it as Israel. Does that mean there's a change in Iranian policy with respect to Israel? I'm not official like Nick, I'm retired. <laughs> but, but I really have no sympathy toward Ahmadinejad's statement denying Holocaust or wiping Israel off the map. This is not new. I have always said, even when I had official post, in 2005, 2006, 2007, I was against such a rhetoric. Another question right here, Hussein. Uh, yes, uh, Dwight Leeper from uh, Westfield. Um, this issue obviously is incredibly important, and yet when countries on either side of an issue are operating, especially over a period of 30, 40, even 50 years, 
Uh, most commonly there are geopolitical issues of uh, energy or commerce or whatever that are the underpinnings of uh, the way that, that countries are operating and what, what their overall strategic goals are. Can you comment on what you believe the West and perhaps the United States specifically, what the underpinnings are of our geopolitical interests are that make us such an adversary in your narrative of how things are going? Uh, for uh, a final deal between Iran and the US, uh, by the way, uh, you may don't know, uh, I spent about quarter of century of my time in Iranian diplomatic uh, core or National Security Council focusing on improvement of relation between Iran and the West, Iran and the US. Uh, that's why when I'm talking in Iran or we have been working in Iran, I uh, and friends of mine, we have been always accused of westernized Americanized or even some, 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 some radicals, they are not shy enough, shameful enough even to say, he, the, these people, they are Americans. But to be realistic, we need the US to respect the, 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 the legitimate interest of Iran in the region. And Iranians to respect the legitimate interest of the US in the region. Here is the deal. In Afghanistan, although we, Iran and the US, they are the most hostile country in the world, but we are supporting the same government in Iraq. Iran is supporting Maliki. The US is supporting Maliki. Therefore, it's clear we have a big room and opportunity to cooperate with a common interest government we have to fight terrorism, extremism, Salafism, to cooperate together on stability. If Iran respects the US rights or interest in Iraq, and Americans also, they, they, they uh, recognize Iranian interest in Iraq. This is not the only issue. Iran is supporting Karzai in Afghanistan. The US is supporting Karzai. And the US allies in the region, they are against Maliki and Karzai. <clears throat> can you, can you uh, think a little bit? The US allies in the region, they are fighting Maliki and Karzai, which the US is supporting. And Iran is working with Karzai and Maliki, which uh, the US is supporting. Therefore, here again, this is a big interest, a big interest to bring stability and to, to, to fight the core of terrorism and radicalism which is erupting from Afghanistan. On energy, definitely. I don't believe the US would like to stay forever to spend tens or hundreds of billions of dollars in Persian Gulf or in Middle East. Ultimately, they would withdraw. But the vacuum would be dangerous. To create a cooperation, a, a regional cooperation system in Persian Gulf between Iran, GCC, Saudi Arabia, and other GCC members, and Iraq, with a good relation with the West, US, NATO, for a regional cooperation system for security, peace, and stability, and let the US to bring billions of dollars to invest in the US. These are the kind of common interests we have, and we should work on it. And it might be possible to start if you stopped supporting the terrorists in Hezbollah and Hamas and Syria. Because you're right, there are some common strategic interests in South Asia, in Afghanistan, certainly. But in the Middle East, where we've been looking today at the maps that Greg and others have put up here, you are the leading but, supporter of terrorist groups in the Middle East against Israel, the moderate Arabs, the Palestinians, and the United States. If, if the US war uh, on terror was against Al-Qaeda, Iranians, they maintain US-founded, late, 
the foundation of Al Qaeda, the biggest terrorist group worldwide. We don't exactly see it that way. Um, <laughs> let's go to a remote a question from a remote location. No question. Okay, right here. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mike Stein, Belfast, of Maine. Uh, you talked about the Iraq problem of uh, the Western nations against Iraq when the Iran-Iraq war came, uh, the other Arab nations. But it's my understanding that one of the reasons that Iran managed to survive was that the Israelis provided them with spare parts and materials for their American uh, uh, equipment in the fight. Whatever happened to that relationship? See, uh, uh, when I said Iranian leadership, the former leader, the current leader, they, they permitted the governments to go for direct negotiations. Uh, this deal was cooked during the war, and the, the objective was not a little bit uh, weapons. It was a very, very small amount of weapons. Considering just $100 billion which regional countries they paid to Iraq during the war against Iran. This was just a peanuts. But the objective was to open the door for direct negotiation between Iran and the US. And McFarlane came to Tehran with previous agreement of Iranian supreme leader. And uh, before his, coming, his arrival in Tehran, there were, there were Iranian delegations in, in Washington, Iranian representative. But it failed because it, when, when they uh, arrived in Tehran, they didn't tell Iranians that they have uh, an Israeli official. And these small weapons also, they are made by Israel. It was too much. At the same time, for Iranians, it was too much. Because already to sit with US, it was too much. To add Israel and Israeli weapon, this would be a big blow to every government in Iran. This was a big mistake. Even they did not tell Iranians that they, they, an Israeli is coming. This was the problem with that event. Hussein, I think, I think we have a question that is pertinent to your elections. I just saw it flash up on the screen, Jim. If you've got it, yes. Question from Ellsworth. The upcoming elections in Iran, they're in June, your presidential elections, will lead to a new leadership. Will that change Iran's stance, do you think, in the negotiations with the US and other countries over the nuclear issues? Yes and no. It depends, I really believe it depends to the US. Right after the war, Rafsanjani decided to, to go for uh, lifting the tension between Iran and, the, Iran and the US. I was nominated by him. That was the late 1980s? Yeah, I want to say the first government right after the war. The, 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 the US president, Bush father, sent a message for Rafsanjani. Goodwill for goodwill, forget the past. You help us to, to, to release Western hostages, including American hostages in Lebanon. We would show a goodwill. Then we would open a new road for relations. This was the message, not through one channel, about more than 30 channels. He decided to, to trust. Iranian Supreme Leader was skeptical. But me, he, he, he nominated uh, uh, a colleague in foreign ministry and I, both of us, to, to work on this project to, to facilitate the, the, the release of uh, American and Western hostages. They were all freed. The US did not reciprocate the goodwill, but they showed more hostility. Here failed. Another example everyone knows here when, when uh, the unfortunate event of 9-11, 3,000 Americans, they were killed. The US announced war on terror. They sent a message for Tehran, Washington. They invited Khatami, another administration, to cooperate on war on terror against uh, uh, Taliban al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. We shake the hand. Iranian generals, for the first time in the history, 
shoulder by shoulder, they, they, fight, they fought against uh, Al-Qaeda and Taliban. They cooperated. Iran left all its capital in, in, in Afghanistan at the disposal of the US. That's, that's why they could remove immediately, within a short time, Taliban. Right after uh, uh, victory, Iran's cooperation with the US to remove Taliban and Al-Qaeda, the, the President Bush, the son, right after this event, announced Iran as access of evil. This was the reward to Iranians. If the next uh, 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 Iranian uh, election, I believe this would be really the same. Iranians, they have showed many times their goodwills. In practice, not just in talks. In practice, like hostages, like Afghanistan. If the US is ready to reciprocate with goodwill, then I believe this would be another opportunity, definitely, to, to, to bring a change. Isn't it a two-way street? When yes. President Obama made his, had his first inauguration in January 2009, he had that famous reference to the clenched fist. And he said, if you unclench it, I'll essentially meet you yeah, halfway. Yeah, yeah. He was talking to your leadership. Yes. And he sent yes. messages and over to it. Yes. And he was rebuffed by the supreme leader, who, as far as I can understand, Ali Hamanai, is reclusive. He doesn't travel. He doesn't meet a lot of foreign leaders. He seems obsessed by us. If you ask us, and it's legitimate for you to ask us, it is legitimate for you to say, let's have negotiations, let's be more open with each other, let's talk, we have a right to ask the same of you, but your supreme leader and your president, Ahmadinejad, have given us the back of the hand. You consider Ahmadinejad the most radical president Iran has ever had after revolution. And he's right. Thank you. But <laughs> Thank you this president was the first one after revolution who wrote official letter to President Bush in 2008. This president was the first one who congratulated elected president of United States of America, Obama, in 2009. This president was the first one again to write the third letter to President Obama. Obama and President Bush, none of them, they, they, they never responded Iranian president letter. No problem. Obama wrote a letter to Ayatollah Khamenei. But Ayatollah Khamenei responded officially, respectfully, and positively. You may don't know. Obama invited for a relation, uh, improvement of relation. Ayatollah Khamenei personally responded, he, he, he could uh, decline responding because the US has rejected to respond three letters from Iranian president. It was a humiliation, but he did not. He respected Obama. He responded positively. We are ready based on mutual respect and non-interference. The attempt, Nick, failed because the second letter of President Obama arrived in Tehran just days before election, and right after election, the US sided itself with green movement. And then I told Allah Khamenei, he said, what is this logic? If you are going to resolve the problem with us, we are ready, but you are supporting the people in the streets. Go ahead. The, the, the problem, Nick, in Iran, the problem is this. Iranians, they measure, they assess the US not on its words, on its actions. Obama came with very nice words, engagement. It was really nice. I was, I was extremely hopeful. But as I said, a president with engagement policy the first month in, of, in his office signed a directive for covert war. And continuously, Nick, if you look at the US legislations from 2010 
2011, 2012, 2013, continuously the U.S. has continued for sanctions, pressures. To when, when, when just two weeks ago Biden in, in Munich invited Iran for direct negotiations, right? At the same time, time in Washington, the Congress passed a legislation to sanction Iran. Iranians, they do not look what Biden is saying. They look what, what you're doing in Washington, your hostile actions. Here is, is, is the, the dilemma. We need the US to show goodwill if they really want normal relations. Not, not to go with engagement, not to invite with, uh, Iran for engagement and direct talks with hostility, sanctions, pressures, coercions. And this is not the signal for Iran to enter such a, uh, negotiations. Iranians cannot trust. They, they say, which one we should uh, trust, your words or your action? You're saying we have, I think, time for two more questions. Um, before we do that, I just wanted to say, uh, I've listened very carefully to you today, and as you know, I have been a proponent of negotiations with yes. your government, and I continue to support President Obama in that respect. There's a huge chasm between us, yeah. and I think our brief conversation today reveals that. It's almost as if we have Even two... does not reveal all of it. Right. It's very, very short. And it's almost as if we have two different sets of facts and two narratives. So our governments need to spend a lot of time yeah. together to try time and patience. Oh, I agree with you. To narrow the differences. But we're going to have to be honest about the facts and honest about your government's actions, not just the relentless accusations against our government. You mentioned the Green Revolution, June 2009. Ahmadinejad stole the election from the Iranian people. I won't ask you to comment on that. I'm just proud that our government criticized your government because your government shot people in the streets and arrested them by the thousands. I don't expect you to comment on that, but I think President Obama was right to make that criticism. Two questions, and then we'll end. The balcony first. Um, the, the real crisis and the real victims of this rhetoric are the Iranian people. Um, could you describe um, the human toll of the sanctions in Iran? And uh, maybe, Nick, then you could possibly justify them. I, I, I really don't know what is the objectives of sanctions. If the sanctions are because of the nuclear issue, if the objective is to prevent Iranian uh, nuclear activities or to limit I should say this has been completely counterproductive. Compare the day the US, the West started the sanctions, Nick. In 2005, Iran had 1,000 centrifuges. After sanctions, 11,000 centrifuges. Iran had one enrichment site, now has two enrichment sites. Iran was enriching at the level of 3.5%, now is enriching at 20%. Iran had uh, 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 the, the only the first generation of centrifuges in operation. Today they have the second generation, the third generation, the fourth generation. Sanctions pushed Iran for more uh, uh, expanding its enrichment facilities, more just just because to give the message to America, to the US, to world powers, even Russia and China, that we would not submit our rights because of sanctions. And here is the dilemma. More sanctions, more enrichment. If they want to continue, welcome. Both of them, they can continue. But the, the, the other dimension of the sanction is the Iranian innocent nations, which they are harmed. Definitely the sanctions, they have harmed Iranian nation. And uh, uh, in the Middle East, the US would find not many nations, uh, majority of the nations, whether we like it or not, they are anti-America. Anti-Americanism is there in the Middle East, in Arab streets, everywhere. 
But Iranian nations, they have no hostility to, toward American nations. They like relations. And the US is, is exactly punishing this nation, maybe the only nation in the Middle East which they really want relations. So uh, I'll be very brief. Um, the reason that President Obama and President Bush and 190 other countries in the world have put sanctions on Iran is because Iran is heading straight towards a nuclear capability, as far as most of the rest of the world can see. And but because, nuclear capability is not illegal. Many countries, they have nuclear capability. And Japan, and because, Brazil, every country. And, there's and the world powers, they have nuclear bomb. You have nuclear bomb pill. Nick, and since 1968, NPT was ratified. The world powers based on NPT was supposed to give up the nuclear bombs. But for 40 years, you have kept your nuclear bombs. Why you believe you, are, you, are, you, are, you have legitimate right to have nuclear bomb? 10,000 nuclear bombs you have. The other countries, they should have like Japan, Brazil capability. Only every sanctions, pressures against Iran, which doesn't have nuclear bomb. I mean, today the level of sanctions, Nick, against North Korea is less than Iran. Sanctions against Iran is more than North Korea, which North Korea withdrew from NPT, tested nuclear bomb, but the US is, is more punishing Iran because has remained member of NPT and does not have nuclear bomb. I mean, we, we, this is, we, we really don't understand. Is it a kind of uh, support for non-proliferation? Believe me, Nick, I'm really, really scared with such a pressures. If ultimately Netanyahu would be successful to push the US to war with Iran, then the last step would be realized. Iran would divert to nuclear bomb, would withdraw from NPT, and would kick all UN uh, IAEA inspectors from Iran. I'm really afraid of this. You're proving my point by that threat you just made to the United Nations. Now, I'm trying to be very polite here because you're a guest. You've interrupted me several times. Just let me. I'm sorry. You have. I'm sorry. You have. I apologize. So just let me, just let me answer the question. Please, go ahead. 190 countries with sanctions against Iran, and the sanctions are meant to express the displeasure of the international community against your government. And so you're the leading supporter of terrorism in the Middle East. You're heading straight towards a nuclear capability. As I understand the Obama administration's position, they're not going to let you do that. I'm a proponent of negotiations. I hope that our counterparts, not you and me, but the people who succeeded us will have that chance. But we've got to be open and more open and more honest about the facts than I think we've seen today. What about the so we had a question, a last question right here. Thank you. My name is Dick Hoppel. I'm from New Canaan, Connecticut. Um, and maybe we'll end the session with the most naive question of all, but putting aside all that he said, she said, your hypocrisy, our hypocrisy, we didn't trust you for 30 years, you didn't trust us. Can you just explain in simple terms why a country with the second or third largest oil reserves in the world needs nuclear energy? You should ask United States of America why they, in 1960s, 1970s, they brought nuclear program to Iran. If you read the President uh, Ford directive in 1976, in, in the US President directive, it says why Iran needs nuclear 23 nuclear power plants. Despite of all oil Iran had in that time, it was the US. Do you want to say anything else before we finish? No, I just wanted uh, to say, Nick, Believe it or not, Iran is not after a nuclear bomb. If Iranians, they want to make nuclear bomb, the US would not be able to prevent Iran. You were not able to prevent Israel. You were not able to prevent Pakistan. You were not able to prevent India. You were not able to prevent Iran from enrichment. 
if Iranians, they wanted nuclear bomb or they want, they would make it. And you would not be able to prevent. Don't invest on something which really does not exist. Invite the Iranian readiness today. The Iranian foreign minister, Nick, just two months ago in New York said, we are ready for all instruments internationally exists for transparency. Rather than uh, investing on such uh, uh, issues, I believe the US and the West should welcome and offer Iranian respecting the rights of Iran and putting on the table whatever they want for, uh, to, to, to assure that Iran would remain forever a non-nuclear weapon state. This is really in the interest of Iran. This is really in the interest of Iran to stay forever a non-nuclear weapon state. But whatever you want on transparency and breakout capability and nuclear bomb, put all of them together, Nick, and use the time because, because with this kind of uh, uh, rational we have had during the last 10 years, what, what, what is the result today we have? More problem, more hostilities. This is my, my point. Okay, let's hope there can be negotiations. Let's hope there can be a resolution. Let's hope that your government doesn't make the mistake of trying to go towards nuclear weapons. No, I said so, if, if, if there is a military strike, I said this may happen if there is a military strike against Iran. Otherwise, I'm telling you, Iranians, they really don't want. They are offering you for, for uh, in reaching below 5%. Take it. Thanks for coming. Thank you.